he's done an organ and he's such, like a phenomenal fly tire and he does all his flies in hand and these flies are you know I can't even tie some of them on a vice with you know and and he's tying them oh he's incredible and he's tying these flies as he's like walking through the grocery store with his wife or his kids or like he's such a funny he's probably one of the nicest guys I know like total salt of the earth that was Kate Watson talking about someone who has influenced her and who ties flies in hand and without a vice are you ready for another fly tying challenge? This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I want to give a quick shout out to our amazing supporters on our Patreon page. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, to get some bonus content and dig deeper with the show. In today's episode, I interview Kate Watson, a guide on the Fraser River and on the Skeena Basin in BC. We talk about Fraser River bull trout, Skeena steelhead, and some of her best bay fly tips. Kate reminds us why quality and fly time materials are key, some DIY tips for the bulkly, and a big spay casting tip. Don't miss this as Kate talks about a couple of her upcoming hosted trips and why these are a big priority on her list. So, without further ado, here's Kate Watson from katewatsonflyfishing.com. How's it going, Kate? Good, good. How are you? Good. Good to have you on here. We uh, we had a little bit of uh, technical... It seems like about <laughs> half of the shows, something comes up, you know, so it's not a big deal and we work uh-huh. through it. And the cool thing was, the cool thing is what got you on here now to, to chat about some things here. So you ready to get started? Absolutely. All right. Um, I always start off with a little bit on your background. Maybe we can talk about how you got into fly fishing and then how you brought that up to where you're um, kind of up in BC guiding and hitting everything steelhead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'd always fished growing up. And so I grew up in a hunting outfit. And so I kind of already kind of grew up with that guide lifestyle. Anyways, or learning how to manage and run a lodge just through my parents. And I'd always thought, it's so silly, because I always thought that in order to stay in this lifestyle, because I loved it, I'd have to marry into it. Hmm. And then, which is so silly. Now that I think about it, like it's such a silly thing to think of. And gender was never a thing growing up. Like it was you know, the job has to get done no matter who you are. So, Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know why I thought I had to marry into it, but I was in my early twenties and I thought I was sitting like very distinctly sitting on the end of my bed thinking like, no, I'm just going to do it myself. And, uh, yeah, so I started guiding early twenties and it's been, it's been awesome. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And then, and so by marrying into it, you just thought that, um, I mean, what made you think that at the time you couldn't do it on your own? Just I don't know. I think I'd never, I guess I'd, I didn't know any female guides. I think that's why, is that because I grew up in the industry, in the hunting industry, all the guides that I knew were male and mm-hmm. they, their wives would come to visit or their wives would come to help cook or their wives would help drive clients kind of thing. And so I'd just never seen a female guide before. So. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And, and then take that to present day and, and how have things changed when you look at, look out now and see what's going yeah. on. Yeah, It's awesome. Like I, I, I love it. It's really cool. And I think it's kind of blown up a little bit. I feel like only in the last, like even year or two or last three years anyways, um, there's been a huge influx throughout the States I've noticed. Um, a little mm-hmm. bit in BC. I don't think as much though as different places in the States. So it's, it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm, I'm trying to. I, w- I was kind of called out. I mentioned this on a past episode by my, uh, my step, <laughs> my stepdad was kind of like, "Hey, uh, this is earlier on," but he's like, "You don't have a single female on your show." And oh, funny. I know, and I hadn't even thought about it just because it didn't, you know, register. And I was like, "Oh, wow, you're right." And um, so it was funny because I worked really hard to get April on, and uh, she finally came on. April, you know, book in, <laughs> and now I've got a bunch. Yeah. I've got all sorts of, you know, I got Jen coming up soon, and just, you know, the thing is, now that I've jumped into it, there's it just opened the door, which is really cool. Absolutely, yeah, it's neat, and it's it's such a cool, you know, like women have always been part of fly fishing for, you know, years now, but mm-hmm. 
I think they're being acknowledged more. And, and there's definitely a population that are getting into it more now. But uh, I don't know. It's been really neat to see so many women in it. Hmm. No, it is. And so you mentioned the, the lodge. So, And I know, I guess you started fly fishing when you were a, a young kid. What, what Can you take us back to that lodge and what that was like growing up out of that, that whole experience? Yeah. Absolutely. And we'd always kind of done, we didn't really like fly fish as a kid. It was more so like digging up worms and going out and fishing and trolling behind a boat in a lake with my dad. And we started going out doing like salmon trips a little bit west of, of where I'm from here. And that was kind of really when I got into fly fishing. So I was a little bit older um, than just a young kid. But uh, mm-hmm. okay. yeah, growing up at the lodge, it was great. It was... Um, you know, always lots of work to do and we helped build it, which was a cool, as a young, like kind of kid, teenager, it wasn't, wasn't my favorite (laughs) thing to do, but, uh, and as I've gotten older, it's been really cool because I can appreciate that. And now I've been able to take those skills and, you know, transfer them in my own life. Is is it the, um, is it the same lodge? Yeah. So you're at this lodge you built as a kid, you're still working out of and fishing out. Yeah. That's great. And which, what what lodge is it? Uh, it's called Northern Outback Adventures. Okay, and what uh, river system? Well, it's kind of in, well, mostly the Fraser River system. So it's a lot of tributaries. And, uh, and we've got, we, we're actually in a really neat area where we've got the Pacific watershed and the Arctic watershed. So we have a really cool hmm. diversity of fisheries up here. Uh, yeah, that's really cool. Good. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I haven't actually talked. We've talked, um, I've had some, well, as far as the show, the first 30 episodes of this, um, you know, of this show were all steelhead focused. I kind of started oh, okay. off. Yeah. So I had everybody on from all around talking steelhead. So we're kind of coming full circle back now because I've been on trout fishing just uh, specifically for quite a while here. But I'm kind of yeah. thinking now this is more like get, I'm getting into a destination season. And obviously Canada, you know, it's a big destination. I mean, I, but we haven't talked about the Fraser. Can you tell us a little about the Fraser? And, and is it kind of that destination, um, still a destination place? It is in the sense of bull trout. Mm. Um, where I'm located is we don't have in my town here. We don't have any steelhead. The closest would be the closest system, anyways, would be about three hours, uh, three hours west okay. of me. But uh, so around here, though, it's definitely a destination fishery for bull trout. Gotcha. Uh, and, yeah. And what do you consider if you would say your home water? What is your your home river? Home river. Or the one the you fish, bo- the bulk. Yeah. Okay, so that is kind the of your Barclay. gotcha. Totally, and so that would be what, about three hours for me, but but I do st- I still consider that my home water. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, that that helps uh, thinking where we should direct uh, the show here. So yeah, I was kind of thinking, just digging into a little more on the steel, and I've had you know tons of uh, questions that we've answered and stuff, but I know there's still some things out there that we haven't got into that, you know, into yet. So um, maybe you can just talk us talk a little bit about. Do you want to focus on steelhead for a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, maybe you just tell us, you know, on your, say, the the Bulkley or your your home water, you know, how you get into steelhead up there. And if you have anything that's maybe a little different than some of the stuff you hear about, um, you know, when you're out there guiding. I I, I assume you're you're guiding uh, quite a bit throughout the year. Well, I can't guide in the winter here. I could if we moved maybe somewhere a little more south where everything doesn't freeze up, but... Even the rivers, they're starting to freeze up right now. So guide season is over for me. But, gotcha. Uh, yep. Yeah, well, I could go somewhere tropical, I suppose. But, That's right. Uh, are you are you heading <laughs> tropical, or do you, do you do any of the stuff down south? Um, well, I'm doing actually a, a trip to Tarpanville this summer. So I mean, it's still it'll be at the right at the end of my guide season, but uh huh, or summer season, I guess I should say. But uh, cool. So that'll be really fun. I'm starting to get into the hosted trips. Oh, there you um, go. There you go. Yeah. How, how yeah, does the um, how does the hosted trip process? How does that all work? You know, you, can you explain a little bit about you know the back background yeah. there where you kind of get a lodge? I guess you know somebody, and then you get some people together, and how does it all totally, work? Totally. Yeah. So it kind of started off with a, a friend of like a mutual friend, I guess, of a friend, and then he had started this uh, company, Interior Fly Fishing, and or it's a travel fly fishing travel company. And then we started chatting and then he started listing out some destinations. I was like, well, I was like, I have these destinations in mind. And then we kind of both had different contacts and he had already started this company. And then I came on board with him and uh, yeah, so now we've just been working together, trying to find different, different destinations and putting trips together and gotcha. And uh, yeah, making a list. So it's been really neat. Cause it's, I do 
women's trips already just apart or aside from that. So this was something that was kind of now doing co-ed more tropical mm, uh, trips. Would, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe if we have a little time at the end, we can <laughs> dig into some of that, uh, some of the questions I have there. But um, yeah, a couple of the things I had here I wanted to chat with you about is um, one of them was thinking about, um, I guess you had uh, intruders, you know, fly design. And I had one question from somebody in the audience uh, yeah. on Instagram that mentioned he um, he wanted to know about tips on tying, or let's see, See if I can try this. It's John. Uh, I had a couple here. <laughs> oh, Ryan. Ryan ends on Instagram. He said he wanted to know where you learned about traditional spay flies and kind of your mentors and how you got into all that. Oh, fun. Okay. Um, for spay flies, I started. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to think. I made a f- friend who's from East Coast Canada, and they uh, their kind of fishery is uh, fishing for Atlantics being right on the east coast there and so i was already kind of starting to tie flies but they were terrible they're you know big puffy marabou mm-hmm. chickens and uh as so like they were so bad i used like a clumping technique which is <laughs> is where you clump more feathers on top of feathers kind of thing <laughs> and uh and so he started showing me classics and i loved them i would he would give me flies or i'd go through his fly boxes and i was like well, what is this one what is this one and i would go through them and uh, and so that's kind of how I first got introduced to them and I fell in love with them. And I tried to tie them and I still wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but I, I tried and I practiced and I watched YouTube videos and read books and I still wasn't very good though. But, uh, and then I met uh, one of my ex-partners and he's a wonderful, absolutely beautiful fly tire for specifically um, Atlantics and space flies. And uh, he was uh, the one that like really kind of showed me, I guess, how to, the proportions and how to, the historic, yeah, the historical, I guess, piece of it too. So getting me proper books or showing me proper technique, um, giving me little tips, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so I guess he was quite um, influential in, in my little fly time career. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, so and then, you know, you're kind of at a, I've, you know, seen some of your flies on Instagram and stuff that they're, you know, really nice. What do you think is... You know, to get you up that next level, just a matter of time. You kind of practice. Do you have any any tips or anything for mm-hmm. tying tying spay flies? Yeah, I think because like, people ask me that too all the time, and I always say, like, lessons are great. And it, there's a lot of YouTube channels or videos out there, and and some are really good, and some are not so good. And so, lessons are such a good way to start because it, it is a hard style to tie. Mm-hmm. And then the other one would be, and I know this is hard because it's it's like a, a tough pill to swallow to like lay down a good chunk of cash yep. on feathers, yep. but quality materials make such a big difference. That's right. And having quality, you know, heron or some sort of heron substitute or having quality bronze mallard or just anything. If you're going to start marrying feathers, um, having it like good quality goose, goose shoulder, I guess um, it's going to really, really help. Mm-hmm. But, Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. And I think you have, do you have a company you also work with, a uh, fly tying uh, company? I thought I might have seen yeah. something there. Yeah, who, who's that? Yeah, a couple of them, I guess. So I'm with uh, Ligart and Premium Materials. That's right. And they specialize in a lot of the like, premium materials, um, but they'll specialize in like antique threads and antique uh, silk and antique tinsels, so like using real metal tinsels. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then also selling different feathers rhea or heron or oh nice or jungle cock or even more kind of tropical right on um, hard to come by feathers yeah Got, gotcha okay um yeah. so yeah if we get back to the uh to the bulkley um you know yeah. obviously it is a destination um you know place to, to hit up what, what makes the bulkley in that area so special what do you think is the one of the big things for you i know i think for me it's just and i was people ask this too and it's such a special place because the Bulkley is such a different river because I think there's so much structure. Like it has all the qualities of like a small stream, but it's a, a fairly decent sized river, I guess. It's not a, mm-hmm. a huge river, but it's not a small river either. But it has tons of structure and it's so, 
it's beautiful. Like in the fall, all the leaves are starting to turn and there's lots of little creeks that you can kind of wade into or different parts where you can either float down in a little raft or you can take the jet boat up. And so I think there's just so many different opportunities, I guess, to fish in different ways, Mm -hmm. um, which is really fun too. But then just the fish too, there's something about a bulkly fish. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. I was listening to, uh, I mentioned April at the start. I can't remember if it was on our interview or another one, but she was talking about she's got a place on the the Bulkley, and she mentioned that it's gotten so crowded that she she doesn't even go out there unless it's like late in the day or whatever. Um, how how do you how do you um, deal with that now for you how how do you how would somebody get around that those issues? Yeah, it is it is definitely crowded. I remember we went out a couple years ago. Now I guess we had a girls' weekend, and you know we just took our little floaty boats down and went went down in the rafts. But going out, you know, super early. Usually you're leaving with the there's going to be a couple people always at the launch points, but. But either going out really early or I know she'll wait for everyone to to finish and then she'll hit it last light yeah. just from outside her property there. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that trying to get those walk-in spots last right. light um, yep. or trying to hit certain spots that you, know, you can get to first with the jet boat before the floaters come by or try mm-hmm. to hit certain points with, the, with your... Uh, that's rafts right. before anybody else comes by i guess but. gotcha so you're not going to necessarily hop in there with your drift boat and, and beat anybody to the punch you're that it's going to totally. be a busy day if, you, if you're just kind of floating the river yeah yeah and it's it's too bad because like it used to be you know you'd never see that many people floating down but uh, yeah. but the last couple of years it's gotten you know exponentially more busy so it has been the last last few years yeah 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 but i mean it's still a beautiful river and there's still parts of the river that will be quieter than other parts um, just because you can't access them unless you have a jet boat kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's still, there's still ways around it. Okay. And uh, yeah. And yeah. so we're kind of in this, you know, what I'm calling the destination season, you know, I'm kind of focusing mm-hmm. on some of these places and a lot of them are saltwater, but there's definitely places, Alaska, you know, the Skeena, um, that are destination mm-hmm. destination freshwater areas. Do you have, and I'm trying to get a spin where there's like a DIY opportunities for some people that don't have, you know, the money to, to go for the full lodge, which I mean, if they do, that's great. You know, obviously you have a lodge and things like that. Yeah. But do you have any tips for somebody that wanted to go up there and just kind of DIY, you know, just do it on their own? Um, and is that still something that people are doing up there? Totally. And, you know, I actually get this email quite a bit where, um, just even in my own area for bull trout, I'll have people ask, you know, they want to go on a couple day guided trip and then they want to do the rest of them, rest of their week or stay yep. kind of unguided um, together. And that's one thing I always tell people is because we're like, it, it is pretty remote up here and our river systems are remote. And whenever you're dealing with water, you know, there's going to be certain dangers. So that's one thing I always tell people is like, don't go alone. Like, cause you're, if you're in a new country, say like if you're from the, the States or Europe or wherever it may be coming to Canada, um, if you're in a new country, there's lots of things that you don't know for just the land itself, right. but then also different rules for the water, say. Um, so I would always bring a friend with it, uh, mm-hmm. with, with you. And then checking out a local fly shop and making sure that you have all the regs and the rules and making sure that, you know, you're doing everything legal. Because certain watersheds we have up here <laughs> where you can't, if you're an alien resident, you're not allowed to fish on the weekends, say. Right. Um, so making sure that, yeah, you have all your regs down pat, make sure everything's good. But, okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, basically, but, yeah, yeah. Being a friend, check out the fly shops and... Do your research, um, ask lots of questions, um, hire a guide for a day, and then it's super easy to get out after that. Once they can kind of show you a few spots, right? Maybe yeah. they might give you some tips too, some put-in spots, or mm-hmm. or maybe you had researched online. Because there's lots of things online where you can find, you know, perfect, like they tell you, GPS coordinates to put in spots now. So there's tons of that, but asking around or asking, you know, if you hire a guide for a day, Asking if there's any other spots that won't be so busy or any spots that are fishing well, and they might 
might let you in on that too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are, that's, I think the, that's usually the take home message is you spend a little bit of money up front and it'll save you a lot down the line. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they can tell you different things too, where, you know, if there's any obstructions on the river, because our rivers change quite a bit here, especially if you're going in, let's say the spring, if, if it's been, you know, they fill up with ice jams all winter and then springs, usually a bit of flooding or there's like huge log jams or there might be, um, you know, overhanging branches or there might be something, some sort of obstruction. So, you know, these guides are one of the first ones to know if mm-hmm. there's any dangers or if you should pull out early or whatnot. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned, um, or I was just thinking, you mentioned your, uh, your ex partner. I was thinking about a, a story, you know, occasionally I'll ask this question about a story that, you know, influenced your life or changed, affected you getting to where you are. Um, I'm assuming your your ex partner was a, an ex boyfriend or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I uh, I was just thinking. I mean, I'm I'm kind of going through a, a, a little bit of a struggle on the same you know oh. the same the same lines right now. Is there uh, you know any tips you have going through that? Um, you know, this is totally off the uh, yeah. you know you know off the thing, but uh, <laughs> no, you know, when you go through those those tough times. Totally. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. That is tough. That's, mm-hmm. uh, it's never fun. I mean, it's, it's not something that, that you ever hope that happens, but I think, I think as it's hard to be, and this, I've always said this too, it's so hard to be objective when you're in a relationship. Yeah. And then when you're outside of the relationship and it's like, Oh man, like, you know, how did, how did this happen or, or what happened or why did I allow this or why did I do that kind of thing? Like you, yeah. it's so much more easier to be objective um, on yourself and be objective on the relationship. And so I think, and it's so cliche, but I, I think time does yeah. really help with that. And it, it, cause it gives you that space and that distance and being able to look at it objectively thinking, you know, whether like, uh, right. you know, okay, actually it might not have worked anymore That's or right. we were just heading down different paths or, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. I hear you. No, I think that is. Yeah, it's the time. And yeah, I almost, I almost actually canceled this, <laughs> this, this interview we had oh, here. It, oh, but, no. but I kind of went through it because it was one oh. of those things where that's the other thing. It's like you know what you gotta, you gotta keep yeah. doing your thing, and and you know you totally. can't you can't let it take you over. So I'm I'm glad we're on here. But um, cool. Well, yeah. thanks for that. I um, want to dig. You know, keep it on some of the uh, the fly fishing stuff for sure. Here, I, I had a couple of. Um, <laughs> You know, I mentioned the intruder tips. Um, get get right back into the tips. Uh, but you had an article, I think, on like six in, intruder tips or something like that for tying intruders. Is that was that yours? And can you talk a little bit about those yeah. tips? I know. I'm trying to even think. That was actually quite a while ago. I'm trying to even. Or maybe think, you can just kind of go in some just general tips of of steelhead fly design or just fly design in general. Totally. Yeah. I think um, so. Intruders are, are, are so funny because, um, like, it's an actual pattern, and I think. You know, when you look out there, there's not a whole lot of information. That's when I was reading online. I was I was trying to find, you know, just information about intruders, and yeah. I couldn't really find anything specific. Or I'd read a lot of um, like contradicting articles, where it's like, well, one article says this, and this hmm. article says that. So um, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with and and tie flies, which was, and he's such a cool guy, he's super casual, oh, and cool. he's. Um, have you ever listened to any of his podcasts or heard him speak? Or, I, I, I've, yeah, I listened to your, uh, J- Jerry French on uh, April's podcast. I heard that one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. yeah. And he uh, was such a funny guy. Like, uh, you know, I think he was a bit of a wild one uh, a couple <laughs> of years ago. He might still be a little bit of a wild one, but uh, yeah. so chill. And he so was able to talk to him and, you know, get like the actual, like, what uh, what actually happened, how it was actually created. Yeah. And uh, just through... You know, being that, I don't know, I was trying to write another article on this, actually, is, okay, I'm sort of, kind of sidetracking here, but yeah. how I think as fly fishermen and as either guides or when you work in a camp or when you're just out in remote places, you're either the land or the, you know, the lifestyle kind of forces you to be handy and it forces you to, you know, MacGyver your way out right. of certain things or or just figure things out. And that's kind of how the intruders started was, you know, they're up in Alaska and then they're coming down through BC fishing and, and it kind of, you know, they realized like catching these huge rainbows on using huge hooks wasn't working because a lot of the fish were being like Mm -hmm. deep hooked and and hurting the fish and a lot of fish lethality. But uh, 
once they started, you know, making a bigger fly, but still with a small hook, that was working for them. And so I think that they're kind of being forced to be creative, which is really cool, um, mm -hmm. and which I think fly fishing often can lead to is, is a lot of different creative endeavors. But uh, yeah, yeah. so I found that really interesting to sit down with him and, and talk about what the intruder actually was and, and how it kind of came about and how he created a little rubber butt section on there. And I think he used um, – the insulation for around a wire oh, in, yeah. in speakers, That's which, right. yeah, like quite creative and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> and now it's, yeah. uh, yeah, now it's kind of the ubiquitous fly for all steel headers out there now. Everybody, totally. everybody has and one. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest difference between the intruder and just the typical traditional like spay, mm -hmm. spay flies or what's the, I mean, I know yeah. they're a lot different, but like when you fish them, I, I go, well, I guess, are you using both, both styles? I mostly use spay. Yeah. Uh, very rarely will I use an intruder. I like to use little, and I think this is the reason I guess why is because everybody fishes intruders on the river. Hmm. And so, you know, they're throwing or swinging these ginormous like turkey dinners <laughs> past all these fish. And then I can come behind them with like a little, yep. you know, like a little snack pack with a little tiny black or dark or all of space. How, fly how small just, are you going on those little guys? Uh, you can use anything from, I use a lot of like three aughts. Um, okay. Those are kind of most of my actual flies is a lot of, like blue hair and number threes or partridge. So you're still using a pretty things, decent size hook. And, yeah, it's still a decent one, but you yeah. can get even smaller too. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you're not but, using a, like a size, you know, down on some of the summer steelhead stuff, you know, down here where, you know, you're using, you can use size tens. Yeah. I've heard that. I've so never really, actually tried to, but those are kind of different. Those are kind of more of a buggier uh, fish. They're, they're kind of more trouty, I guess. And they're, yeah. they come in, but, um, Okay, so yeah, that, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and the, so those spay flies, some of the some of your flies, most of those are kind of two aughts or three aughts in size. Yeah, most of them. But I guess you could tie them smaller, but uh, mm -hmm. they're actually a little bit harder to tie when they're smaller. So okay, hey, yeah, <laughs> I, I was just like the three aughts. I was just reminded. <laughs> I wanted to go back to we were talking about the the breakup thing there. Um, but I was yeah. trying. To, I was trying to get that to a story. Did Did you have a story in your life that kind of you know sticks out as affecting? You know, and you don't have to answer that right now if you don't have it off the top of your head, but just something that, you know, um, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people that, that are in it, you know, they guide and then they get out of guiding and there's a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Some people that don't stay in it. Is there something that's made you, I mean, I guess you're still young too, so you might not stay yeah. with it as well. What do you think, what do you think uh, when you look back and then when you look forward? Yeah, I think, um, cause I had loved like growing up, I loved the lifestyle and I just loved the. you know, kind of dictate, in a sense, um, how your career is going to go. It's a lot of work, but it's uh, there's a lot of freedom, too. And it's such a cool industry, the, the fly fishing industry is such a cool industry just to be part of yeah. um, with really awesome people. But I think, I don't know if I'll guide. I'll probably, you know, I kind of said a couple, you know, a couple years ago now that I would like to do 10 years. And I think if I did mm -hmm. 10 years of guiding, I feel like it would be enough you know, credit or whatever street cred that I want gotcha. to give myself that, uh, cause I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to do it forever. Cause it's, you know, it's hard on your body. Yeah. <laughs> it's like rowing is, uh, yep. you know, I love it, but it's, uh, it's hard on your body for sure. And, uh, yep. so I think I'll probably always be in the industry cause I do love it. And so be in the industry maybe in different ways. So after guiding, maybe doing more workshops or hosting trips or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Maybe okay. Writing more or whatnot. But, uh, uh, and and yeah. you mentioned, uh, or you didn't mention, but I was thinking about um, you have what is it? Is it a fly fishing school or something that that you have on your website? Can you talk a little bit about what what that's all about? Yeah, I do um, quite a few kind of mostly women's schools where you know getting getting a group of women together. I call it a school, and it's not like the Orvis school kind of thing. So it's more so just a play on words. But it's um, a school in the sense that, you know, we sit down and we go from absolute like basic beginner casting to you know, extend the lessons that you should do over a period of weeks. And then if I want to, if they want to, you know, get more lessons after that, then we can continue that way too. But oh, gotcha. uh, 
So I call them school, but it's yeah. essentially kind of like fly fishing 101. Gotcha. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I was just thinking, I had uh, John uh, Mendez, another person out, and I guess I think this is on Facebook. He was asking about tips on uh, tying your knot in the freezing weather. You guys definitely, you mentioned things are frozen <laughs> up there before you oh, before yeah. you hung up the uh, the, the <laughs> vest. How, do you have any, I mean, what do you do when it's, uh, are you still fishing out there when there's guides on the, on the guides or there's fr- frost on the guides and everything? Totally. Oh, frost. There's icicles on yeah. the guides. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's still spots to fish. And, and you know, winter steelheading, it can be really good up here. So th- that's always exciting, too, uh, snowshoeing into different places or whatnot. But, yeah. uh, you know, there's little tricks. And I've never – I haven't tried this because I don't know – I don't know. People say, but I don't know how it would actually work is putting like Pam on your lines, but I feel like it mm. would ruin your lines because, because uh. lines are so porous. And so I, I would be nervous to, you know, spray this can of grease on my, yeah, that would be weird. Yeah, I know. But then I've heard of putting Vaseline on your guide. So I might actually oh, yeah. try that this year. There you go. I've never actually tried. I usually just, you know, when my guides freeze up. I usually just, just take my fingers and just Crack them. Kind of hold it on the guides. Yeah, crack right, them or hold them right. on the guides so they melt. But, that's right. That's right. What about what about if you're um, having to tie some knots or tie up a leader yeah. out there? Is that is that doable? <laughs> How do you do uh, that? It it's doable. It's uh, I think too. Like you kind of just get climatized, right? Like so. Yeah. It's cold, and I'm like I'm the first one to be cold when we go out, and so you know I've got you know those little hot hands where you like shake them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, the silica gel or whatever it is. Um, so I've, like those are shoved everywhere yep. like two in each pocket sometimes i just like drop them down the legs of my waders <laughs> and like my whole you know i'm like probably their best clientele um i buy so many of those things but That's so i just keep those on me all the time and different things where you know where winter still heading's a little bit slower so if we want to stop and create a or like light a fire on the beach oh yeah if it's a long run kind of thing sure you know, your fire is nice because then you can you yep. know go through the run maybe rest it for a little bit sit by the fire warm up maybe tie new leaders tiny whatever and then go through the run again but, uh, nice nice yeah, yeah. Those, those are good tips mine i love the like just the basic uh, wool fingers fingerless gloves oh yes you know what i mean like totally. nothing nothing super thick just like the lightweight uh, yep. you know i mean i don't go anywhere without those things and those are the best i agree so, i totally agree yeah. i had a pair or i still have this pair and actually you know because you can get some pretty Fancy things out there and nice things. Filson makes like an awesome, you know, light wool fingerless gloves. But my dad had a pair from when he was a teenager, like these like, you know, old school wool. And I still, I use those. Those are, I've been using them for years and I love them. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, yeah, they're just, you know, they work. Like I guess they're like, you know, it's classic wool. That's it. Fingerless gloves. That's it. And pretty much that and a, uh, and a hoodie and you're pretty much good to go. Yeah, I got a couple more layers than that, but well, no, it's true. No, I mean, I do too. I do too. But you got you got to have at least those two things to, totally. to be good. Okay. Um, so, and I was thinking, you know, about I guess we haven't really talked about your mentors and things like that too much. But do you know, you know, like you got people out there, especially with fly design, like Sid Glasso, and mm-hmm. you know, some of these people are out there. Are there is there anybody that sticks out to you um, that influenced you, whether it was fly fishing or, or fly design? And you know, can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about them? Yeah, totally. I think with the kind of space style flies, there's so many good fly tires today. Like it's, it's actually really incredible because it's such an old art, really. Like it's, you know, these flies were 18, like 1800s. And to have people carrying on those traditions or that, that history is, it's quite That's remarkable. Cool. And to, and to carry on these traditions with actual, you know, feathers and not substituting these feathers and, and tying them in hand some of them uh, is really exciting so mm-hmm. I, I think uh, Adrian Cortez is he's done in Oregon and he's such, like a phenomenal fly tire and he does all his flies in hand and these flies are you know I can't even tie some of them on a vice huh. with really you know, he does them in and hand he's holding tying the them Oh, he's incredible. And he's tying these flies as he's like walking through the grocery store with his wife or his kids. <laughs> or, Holy like, cow. He's such a funny, he's probably one of the nicest guys I know, like total salt of the earth. And he is, he's hysterical. He's got such a funny personality and he, he posts quite a bit on Instagram and, and Facebook a bit, but uh-huh. of just pictures of him tying 
flies like in just random places like in the car that's cool the grocery store or like shopping he's got his kids or his wife kind of shopping in front of him and he's behind you know a little fly in his hand as he's walking through the store with them but <laughs> so he'd be one of my okay. kind of top i guess uh, influences and then there's so many other you know amazing fly tires too that will bush is um his flies are beautiful i think he's one of my favorite fly fly tires uh-huh um, he's really and just so talented and he's been doing it since he was, you know, a kid. He started tying flies the first started fly fishing and, uh, other guys, there's another guy, Evan Winnett, I mean, Winnett, I think mm-hmm. I might be pronouncing his oh. last name wrong, but he's also a really beautiful fly tire. He posts quite a bit on Instagram and, uh, his flies are always really fun to watch. And then, um, so there's a guy in, uh, Finland, I'm trying to think of the fly tying archive. Uh, Tim, totally forgetting his last hmm. name now. I can. I'll look him up. I um, at uh, at wetflyswing.com slash Kate. I'll have uh, the URL. Uh, I'll have all the links to the people you're talking about here and some other stuff that we covered today. Yeah, I'm totally forgetting. His, I'm blanking on his last name, but he's um, he's actually so his is the fly tying archive. And his flies are incredible because he can tie such a different variety of flies and everything that he ties is like, shit, that, oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on No, it's all good. Like, yeah, no, go for okay. it. I, I just pretty much, I've, I've come to the conclusion after, uh, I think five, I've, I've got five explicit episodes and I said, oh, you know, funny. I'm pretty much just letting them, letting them go. So yeah, feel mm. free. <laughs> Fisherman. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, everything he ties is like, oh my God, that's good. Or like, you know, and they're all quite distinct styles. So he's uh He's pretty cool to watch some of his flies. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. That's good stuff. All right. Um, yeah. And you mentioned. There's tons more. Things. Oh, yeah. No, I know. It's <laughs> this thing we could talk about. And that's the cool thing is that I hope to, you know, make uh, some connections to. Well, you mentioned the the guy in Oregon. I'm actually in Oregon. So I'll have to. I'm not sure if I've ran, run into um, the Cortez uh, before. But that's, yeah. that's somebody I definitely need to connect with and have a beer with, I think. Oh, for sure. No, he's a, he's a riot. And he's a great fisherman. And. He's got this little crew, like they're just this little crew. They come up to BC, and I just I yep. love fishing with them because they, all of them are just like salt of the earth, nicest guys. Todd Aran was another one. Oh yeah, um, and he does. Uh, he's Todd is actually hysterical. He ties all, and only really fishes with like foam dry flies, and he's uh-huh. got these little ninja flies that he's created. And, uh, <laughs> they're they're pretty sweet. They're actually really cool. That's sweet. Cool, but um, <laughs> yeah, those two in particular are just they're a riot. They're good guys to sit down and have a beer with yeah okay all right i'll yeah. definitely link out to those guys and try to connect yeah. with them as well what do you think is um you know if you had to look at a you know your favorite like a, if you had a book a magazine video re- just a resource something that's mm. other than your own is there anything that sticks out for you know, to help for steelhead <laughs> yeah you know who i really like actually is swing the fly oh yeah is i think they've done a really like just their their magazine is beautiful. Like there's tons of magazines out there, and and there's a lot of magazines that are you know really good and have lots of have lots of like ideas and tips and stuff and, yeah. and great articles. But Swing the Fly is I don't know just the way their magazine like they print it super high quality. They print it on like a hard almost like a cardstock paper too. So it's not like that kind of flimsy magazine mm-hmm. kind of newsprint. Um, paper yeah and so it just it feels like like at the coffee table books yeah. it would be something that you know it's like a book you have it's more like a book totally and I, I keep all of them and they do a really good job and their articles are always um mm-hmm. well written actually you know uh both todd Herano and adrian cortez write oh, write yeah. articles for them quite a bit so yeah that's right they got lots of yeah and i've connected uh yeah they're definitely they Hit the Deschutes up down, yeah. down here quite a bit too. So um, yeah, no, that's good. I've been meaning that was part of the thing on the first season. You know, the first thirty episodes, I I could have kept going on Steelhead, and I decided to mix it up. But I there were so many people I left off that I just you know what I mean. Like yeah. thirty, if you had to pick thirty people to interview for Steelhead, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like you don't even come close oh, to scratching the surface. But I hope to come back around with like a full Steelhead season. Um, yeah, down the that would line. actually be kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, and go back into it. Okay, mm-hmm. so what do you think? Um, you know, as far as I know, you spade championships and things like that. Do you, do you have a? Um, I mean, a big struggle for people again is casting. We've talked about it on here before. You yeah. know, whether it's single hand spay, two hand, just you name it. I mean, do you have a couple, one or two tips just for traditional? 
you know, the, the two handed rod uh, tip for somebody that might be struggling a little bit or, or maybe Absolutely, something that yeah. you you help your students. Totally. Yeah. And this is something, again, I think I mentioned this with the tying, you know, there's YouTube is, you know, a platform for everyone and so mm-hmm. everyone good and bad. And yeah. so I think a lot of people are like, Oh, I watch this on YouTube. And there's a lot of really great, really, really great, you know, casting tips and tricks and, and different things on YouTube. And that's awesome. But you have to filter through them. That's right. Because a lot of them, when I watched it, was like, oh, my goodness. Like, no, that's <laughs> not what you do. Or like, oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> now somebody's going to have to teach that person, you know, what to do correct next time. But yeah. I think something that I would, that I always tell my students is if you think you're going, go, if you think you're going slow, cast slower. Because I watch it's like these uh-huh. bull whips out on the river. And yeah. Like, you know, you hear the snap and you can, you see the snap and they're losing flies. And uh-huh. it's like, okay, slow down even more. Yep. And it's uh, from everything from, from your lift to your, when you, and people call it all sorts of things, but yeah. when you white mm-hmm. rabbit your yep. line across, um, you know, corkscrew up kind of thing is just slow down even yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, and that brings back a, an episode all the way back in episode seven. Uh, uh, we I had Pete Humphreys on, and he just broke down some great tips. <laughs> and so that's that's one where we talked mo- mostly about kind of the spade cast and things like that. So somebody, if you wanted to check that, we could go back and check out episode seven. Um, totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good. Well, I um, yeah, I mean, we've been checking off some of the things I wanted to hit on here. One one of the other topics, and this is a little bit. You know, not exactly on, you know, the tips and tricks, but you write for Fly Lords, is that correct? Yeah. You're like a conservation. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about about your your writing there, and maybe just talk about any other places you write? I'm just curious. I know the Fly Lords, the names come up quite a bit. They seem like a pretty new and heavy hitter out there. I'm curious to hear what that whole process works like. Totally. Yeah. It's so that's kind of something that last couple of years I've been getting into. I started off kind of blogging, and then some of my blogs um, became more popular or like blog articles, I should say, mm-hmm. became a little bit more popular. And then, so I started, you know, a couple different articles or magazines reached out. And so I just finished a, an article for Steelheader journal. And then mm-hmm. I've written for uh, fly fusion before and swing the fly and uh, a couple other uh, various magazine articles. But then fly lords has been something this, I guess past year here, um, yeah, I think last spring, I want to say, is when I kind of got on board with them. And just kind of writing, It was we kind of started off writing conservation, or that he asked me to write conservation pieces for, you know, fly fishing and uh, for BC and for mm. wherever else I see, wherever I kind of create a liberty, which has been awesome, but yeah. kind of where I'll, wherever else I see fit or if something's happening in the news. Um Different, you know, interviewing different anglers or diff- interviewing different, um, you know, affluent people within okay. the industry. Yeah, so it's been kind of, it's been really fun because it's quite a, like a lot of creative freedom in that I can kind of, you know, if I find a story or I pick like a, a theme that I want to stick with, then, then you know, they let me kind of do my thing, which hmm. is nice. That's cool. That's cool. So you're, yeah. and, and, and so you're writing, you're kind of a, like uh, like an ambassador sort of thing, or or how does that whole process work? Do they just you kind of choose what articles you want to write about, and then you kind of find some time to do that? I'm, I'm just kind of you know trying to dig in a little more to how that process works. And yeah, 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 totally. It's um, yeah, so they have a, a small team of writers. So they're they're getting bigger. Like it's he it, it started off with a guy Jared Zizu who was mm-hmm. in uh, college and learning how to fly fish, and then created. I think he started with like a blog or a website and started sharing photos and then realized that, you know, sharing you know, high quality photos is kind of where web design yep. and web, you know, traffic is going. And then so started doing that, started doing, you know, started teaching himself photography and then started hiring a few, you know, full-time writers. And then I'm kind of on his like, I don't know if you'd call it casual. It doesn't really have a name, but more of a casual kind of list oh, gotcha. of writers. So there's okay. a little, yeah, a small group of us who just write, um, Right. Kind of between guide season, or write oh, when we can, or write. Uh, yeah, yep. so there's no kind of strict schedule. It's just yeah, whenever you have um, time, and then your, your writing is doing two cool mm-hmm. things because you're not only are you promoting kind of the, the stuff you're doing, but you're talking about conservation, other important topics that that you that totally. you love. So that's cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, the absolutely. topic. The topic came up. I, I I talked a little about it, and not that the Fly Lords was uh, one of the uh, the companies that we were talking <laughs> about, but way back in um, oh what episode fifty. At what well, episode fifty? I'm always trying to figure this out because sometimes I do these. <laughs> I always do these shows ahead, so it's like I'm talking about my future self, whatever. But episode fifty three, I interviewed you know the Drake um, cast. Oh, sweet, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know the Drake magazine, but they have a podcast as well, and Elliot, yeah, Adler, and um, yeah, and we just got in this conversation about the changing dynamic of like the the new companies right there's the new on there's people yeah. that are just online then but then there's the old magazines like the drake well they're kind of the old one yeah. now i guess but so there's all this stuff and not everybody's doing it on the up and up right some people are kind of doing some weird stuff and it's just one of the things with like things are changing and it's Absolutely. and it's interesting to document it because and that's why i hope to get more people on to talk about it because you know i mean I, the tradition the history about fly fishing we're, we're building it right now so it's it's cool to hear about Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that actually, that would have been a really interesting to have, you know, the guys from Drake to sit down and, and chat about it because you now they've been around for, for a little while now. They've seen, they've seen quite a few changes, I'd imagine, just through, you know, even how social media has influenced or influenced, I guess I should say. Oh, yeah. Uh, fly fishing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, and it's, there's just so many people I want to have on, you know, different editors. And I've had a few on and we've talked about some con- some good conversations. But, um, yeah, I hope to get Tom and others on as well to, to, to mm-hmm. dig into it. But, no, it's, it's good. That you're, you're into a bunch of uh, – you're <laughs> writing for some big, big-time magazines and things like that. So that's that's cool to hear. Do you, yeah. do you plan yeah, on continuing? Really... Totally. Cause yeah. I love writing. It's something that – you know, I think that's why, like, this industry is – it's so cool because, you know, you have a lot of, it's a lot of work. Like it's, you know, it's a lot of self promotion and a lot of, you know, getting your name out there, but it's also a lot of, you know, time, you know, after guiding, just sitting behind a computer, I guess, you know, doing invoices and doing all that fun stuff, yeah. but then, you know, writing or creating, you know, fly tying tips or creating you know, fly tying videos or something like where, you know, you're kind of always constantly trying to think of, how can I make this passion, you know, a career and, and mm-hmm. still manage to pay my bills and <laughs> mortgage and all those fun things mm-hmm. that we have to pay. That's right. That's right. That's a, <laughs> I, I occasionally ask those questions on here. I know there's people that, you know, don't want to hear, maybe don't want to hear about it, but it's interesting <laughs> to me because I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm kind of digging into that a little bit, kind of putting my toe in the water, trying to f- get a feel for how people are doing it and stuff. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the bottom line is you just got to, you know, the, well, I guess being diverse and doing a lot of different things is a helpful way to do it. I think so, because it's, I know, I totally agree. I think I'm also nosy like that, where I like to know, it's like, well, how are they doing it? Or like, it seems like, and that's the, you know, problem, I guess, for social media is like, because it seems like, you know, so many people are like, you know, getting by and they're yeah. getting by, but like with, you know, not just scraping by kind of thing. And so yeah. I always wonder, you know, how much, how much of it is real? How much of it is it is? You know, they're out, you know, buying their own gear or are they getting it yep. given? And then it's like, can you trust the review if it's an ad kind of thing? Like it's. Uh, That's right. I don't know, it's, it's it's getting to be quite a, a tricky <laughs> market, I guess I should say. It is. It is. Yeah. It's uh, well, the take home measure. <laughs> I've, I've heard this quite a bit uh, from people and on all ends of it, joking about it both ways, but like, don't get into fly fishing for the money, you know, is always the, <laughs> totally. is the constant thing. And that's, you know, that's a good thing to just think about because that's, that's obviously true. You got to be passionate about it. Um, but you know, I think there are some people that are, you know, obviously doing it. Um, yep, I've talked absolutely. to a bunch of people. I mean, most of the people, when I look at the people who have been on this show, everybody from, you know, I mean the old school Trey Combs all the way yeah, up nice, through, yeah. you know, Simon and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, people from all over the ends, new and old. Um, no, I had a guide on, you know, a while back that was just kind of brand new. So yeah, it, it's a good mix, but I mean, I think you can do it, but you just gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta be able to stick with it. That's kind of the bottom line. Exactly. And I think that's where, you know, it, it comes down to your passion because if you're passionate about it, you're going to make it work yeah. no matter what. And, you know, things and people see your passion. And I think that's when opportunities arise is when people see your passion, either they want to help you out by giving you an opportunity, or they see your passion and want to work with you and want to, you know, see you succeed, I guess. That's and, a, uh, yep. Yeah. And that's I think a, those people, you know, you get Simon, like, it's yeah. a gem, but like, oh, yeah. people like that, they stick out because of their passion. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how you make it is, 
is staying true and remembering, I guess, why you got into it. Right? Yep. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You didn't get into it for the money. You got into it because no. you, you love it. And so once you got into it, when you went from, well, you were always in the lodge, but yeah. when it became guiding, did you lose, you know, sometimes you hear people talk about how when it becomes a job, you know, did you ever feel that at all along the way? No, I know. And I'm part of me is scared for that. Cause it's like, Oh, I hope I don't ever like get that feeling. But uh, yeah. I think it's done the opposite. I think it's honestly, it's made me more excited. I think more, maybe because I'm more attuned to it now and, and because I'm kind of forced in a little bit to stay on top of things and, mm-hmm. you know, make sure I know what's out there and, and who's out there and what's on the market and new gear and stuff. And so new lines and new rods and trying different things. And so I think, you know, the ability trying new things is always exciting and trying new fisheries is exciting. So yeah. going from salt to fresh to even just traveling through That's you know, right. different places Tarpon. in your own Totally, yeah. Tarpon Tarpon. Bill. Who, who, now, who is the, when you think of tarpon, who's, is there a name that pops out that is like a big tarpon person, mm. whether historic or current? Yeah, I think, you know who, and she's not really tarpon, but um, instantly, and I think, and she's not even in the, well, she's a little bit, she's kind of close, but I think Lorianne Murphy. Oh, and Because right. uh, she's more like permit, I guess. Oh, She's gotcha. more kind of Belize. Oh, yeah. But, um, where, now, where are you headed? Uh, Tarponville, so it's in Costa Rica. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, it's like right on the edge of Costa Rica and uh, right in the jungle. It's actually really, oh, wow. the lodge is, um, actually, uh, Mark Martin is the, uh, or. Oh, okay. Is the lodge owner? Or? Yeah, now I'm getting it. Yeah, Mark Martin is uh, the lodge owner. And oh, he did a, he's got a San, Fr- no, San Diego guide outfit for Mako Sharks. He did a, <laughs> is it IF4 or. One, I think it was one of the IF4 films last year for Makos, and uh, it was crazy. It was, yeah. it was it was fun to watch, but it was like, yeah, it was insane to watch, you know, fishing for, you're not even fishing for sharks. Like, no. they're using fly rods, but, like, Jeez. it's like the sharks are hunting you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was intense. Okay. Yeah, it was super intense. It's like these giant refrigerators, you know, That's so jumping and back flipping. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get more into this destination stuff because I've got Total. all sorts of, I've got like, um, oh, just some huge guests. I've already had a couple on that we've talked to, Oliver White and some others, but I got, oh, sweet. Yeah. It's, you know, again, how, where do you go? Because there's so many species now all over the world exactly. that people are hitting. And um, so it'll be fun when I dig into it. And I know tarpon will be on my list. Um, I've actually got flip, uh, flip pallet on next week. And oh, gotta, cool. That's okay. Yeah. A, yeah. A challenge to dig into that. But, um, okay. Well, before, um, I've got a little rapid fire around here. If you got a, yeah. you got a few minutes Perfect. Yep. and, uh, and we'll wrap it up with that. So, uh, I always do the, the two, two and two. So your, your top two flies, maybe if you Ooh. think of, uh, your top two tips, just general fly fishing or whatever. And then, and then a couple of, uh, resources. Okay. Okay. Um, in any particular order? No, no, if you just, yeah. No? Okay. Yeah. Top two flies, I think, uh, kind of staying in the classics, Lady Caroline. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, I've been really digging the the Dallas fly. The Dallas? Uh, with the Dallas. Yeah, I, I've posted, I, don't know, I posted a picture of them a bit ago here, but uh, it's a, a really cool fly where it's one of, it's considered a, it is considered a true spay fly, but it's one of the only few that use turkey wings instead of bronze mallard wings. Huh. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's got a big, um, it used to use like wool, but now you can use kind of semi seal or some sort of dubbing to do kind of a big red head on the front. So it's almost mm-hmm. like a super oh, fancy yeah, I saw, classic I saw that. Yeah, exchange. I saw that fly. It's sweet looking. <laughs> yeah. It looks it, like a, it is a sweet looking fly. What it looks like is a, um, it looks like basically a traditional, you know, a nice traditional spay, but it almost like yeah. a mix between that and an egg-sucking leech kind of. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly what It's like a fancy egg-sucking that's leech. That's great. It's beautiful, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I think that's, I don't know, I, I did really well on that this year. So mm-hmm. I think every year that I'm always like, this is the fly, and then I fish <laughs> that all season. That's right. But, uh, yeah, so that, okay, so two tips then. Yeah, um, I guess it could be anything just general. I don't know if you have maybe a new person coming in that's that's new to oh, it. Yeah. What, what do you what do you uh coach them on oh i think well the one that i said before i think that's so important because i see it all the time yeah bull whips on the river is, is slow down all right so slow your casts down you know when you're when you're starting to lift your cast like you so i guess maybe i should start that saying like you have complete line control when you keep everything tight and the only way to keep your line tight is when you're 
you're lifting slowly and you're doing slow movements and you're not jerking, jerking. or yeah and so doing yeah. you know, like a bull whip crack so slow slow everything down slow yep. your cast down slow your lift slow your white rabbit so you know, corkscrew up and then uh, my second tip then maybe to to finish off the cast would be when you're casting is lining your body so lining like squaring your shoulders squaring your hips and squaring your feet a lot of times we say skagit casting like simon will always teach us where when you're skagit casting um having your feet like train tracks kind of like um, parallel with each other but when you're doing single spay or doing something you know a bit longer lines i was like just kind of like you're snowboarding or whatever right? you keep one foot in front one foot in the back and so that's going to give your hips you know you can move with your hips a bit more and because you can use your you can roll back and it's a little bit you can get a little bit the longer distance when you roll back like that but so ending your cast like right in your armpit so make sure that you're lined up and you're squared into your target with your hips and your shoulders and then ending your cast with your bottom hand in your armpit and gotcha. it's like really yeah you know, oh, right yep yeah so when you after you've kind of you've uh, white rabbited across and now you're corkscrewing up and then right as you're in your home position or firing position or a lot of people call it different things yep. you know, you've got the baseball arm almost and right there and then when you push and pull your top and bottom hand your bottom hand should end lined up really nicely right under your armpit so yeah. like everything is square i like that yeah that's a good that's yeah. a good tip for sure yeah remembering yeah. gives you a good visual okay and then and you mentioned one resource the uh the magazine swing the fly yeah swing the fly uh did you have any any other um oh and, and any other i guess we mentioned kind of the, the YouTube stuff, but um, yeah. any other magazines or books that you want to note? Yeah. You know, actually, who's really good is, uh, and she's hysterical, is um, the Quilted Fly Tire. She's oh. got a website, and she does, uh, like, her dry flies are incredible. Huh. There's Nicole March, and oh. she's, you know, a New Jersey, you know, like, a thick New Jersey accent, and, I, like, so funny. She's such a funny person. Okay. And she does... She has a website and a blog called The Quilted Fly Tire. And she does a lot of different, like using quills and, and doing dry flies and a lot of nymphs too. Sure. But does a lot of tips and demos and her her flies are incredible. So I think I would, I definitely, I look at hers when I'm trying to do like yeah. smaller kind of trope flies. Yeah, that's, those are, those are difficult. Okay, those are great. Yeah. And yeah. do you have a, well, you have tarpon, tarponville. Do you have any other bucket list uh, species or destinations you want to hit Ooh. up? Oh, there's so many. There's uh, if you had to say your pick, pick your your top your your top one that you got to go top to. Top one. I'm really like Mongolia. The last oh, yeah. couple of years here, Mongolia has been on my mind. Yep, that would be That's an awesome. Nice. That would be an amazing trip. Oh, it'd be such a cool. That's the cool thing about the Mongolia stuff, and well, a lot of places, but. Gosh, you get not only you get that experience, you know, just the the way out there, right? I mean, Mongolia, exactly. right? There's nothing that's going to be even close to that. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's it because it's, you know, the fishing yeah. would be incredible, obviously, and and that's why you're going in a sense. But then right. there's just so much more than that. And exactly, and, you know, Rachel, a Finn, she's a, oh yeah, yeah, I got her. another yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay, so she's, she's another yeah. hysterical, like so funny. Yeah. But oh, she is cool. Oh, she's so funny. Uh, oh my I god. I haven't talked to her. Yet. We've just been chatting on email. Oh god, like she's a gem. But she uh, she's been saying lately, and I love this because it's more. It's not just about the fishing anymore. And I think that's where, especially a lot of the old school guys and women and is kind of getting at, it's not about the fishing yep. anymore. And she's been saying, she's like, it's all about the hang, man. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> she's, the she'll hang. probably say that to you. It, we're, uh, it is true though. It's like, yeah. it's all about, you know, it's more about just the fish. Like it's, it's everything. Now. It is. It is. That's, yeah. that, that's the take home mess. I think we could probably, you totally. know, like leave it at that because it's, and I, I, I think the more <laughs> you get into it, the more you realize that. And that's, that's a cool thing about the whole destination stuff is that exactly. it brings that whole new thing. You know, obviously the, the U S and there's all sorts of amazing places to fish and, and even yeah. in your own state, but um, yeah, getting outside and getting to a different culture and, and all that is, is pretty amazing. Exactly. Yeah. That's and just cool. kind of being, allowing someone else to teach you whether you want to DIY it or not, yeah. you know, you're going to have to have help somehow along the way, whether that be with language or, uh, you know, cultural customs or, you know, things to do or not to do. Um, and so just allowing someone to teach you and, and to be new and to accept that it's okay to be, you know, new and you don't have to be the hardcore guy 
you know, trying to prove or whatever, if you have an ego or whatever, it's yep. I think just allowing yourself to try something for the first time exactly. and to be new with it and to be okay with it. So, yep. yeah, yeah, nice. Well, I think uh, we're going to have to cut it here. I just had yeah. a couple more questions. Uh, I guess the one thing is the next six to 12 months, anything uh, you want to note upcoming for yourself or anything new that we can mm. look forward? Next six to 12 months. Well, like uh, Tarpenville. Yeah. Are you going to do any sort of a, like, a, you know, a web blog, you know, whatever, a blog or like video kind of track yeah. any of that? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then trying to do a couple, I've got a couple other destination trips that aren't um, solidified yet. So I guess I won't mention those yet until they're totally like confirmed. But uh, yeah, lots of new things for this new, this year, upcoming 2019. Okay. Okay. So, and yeah. if, and one other, uh, I guess I just had this noted on the rapid fire round. What do you, yeah. do you uh, have a favorite music type of music? Oh, band, anything favorite you like? type of music. Oh, um, I don't know. I'm so, uh, I'm so, I'm all over the board with music. Like yeah. It could be Americana. It could be like Elton John. Uh huh. Loved Elvis growing up. Yep. <laughs> like, so I'm, kind of, I'm all over the board. Kind Me of blue. Too. So were you yeah. more of a Elvis or a Beatles? My mom was, this is actually kind of funny, my mom was hardcore Elvis fan. Like, yep. we were put into piano lessons, my sister and I, just to learn Elvis songs. And we had oh, yeah. you know, life-size Elvis pictures around the house. And we had every Elvis record and 8-track and v, um, oh, we had all his VHS movies. And then we had all the uh, tapes. And then after, you know, even though they're all the same, then she bought all the CDs, like, we had so much Elvis growing That's up. Cool. So, so I think I was more of an Elvis Yeah, fan, he, he is the king. <laughs> he is the he king. Is the king. He's the king. I know. I know. I was always a, yeah, I, I'm a little torn. I, I like them almost both equally. But uh, totally. okay. Okay. Well, I guess we'll, yeah. we'll leave it off with that. We'll, maybe I can throw in some, I'll find some good uh, Elvis classics to throw in the show notes. Perfect. And uh, we'll, we'll leave it with some, some good music. But uh, yeah, Kate, I, like I just uh, appreciate you uh, coming on. And this has been a lot of fun. I, yeah. I'm slowly getting around and connecting with so many people. And I'm sure we'll circle back around, you know, down the line and maybe get you on and talk to us about some more stuff you have going. But yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on and uh, we'll Absolutely. keep in touch. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, all right, see ya. Okay, have a good night. All right. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Kate. That's K-A-T-E. And a quick shout out to our patrons at wetflyswing.com slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And get started there and find out uh, how you can support the show. And if you want to subscribe via text, just uh, text WFS to 31996. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.